of Tuor and the Fall of Gondolin. It has been told that Huor, the brother of Hurin, was slain in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. And in the winter of that year, Rian, his wife, bore a child in the wilds of Mithrim, and he was named Tuor, and was taken to foster by Anael of the Grey Elves, who yet lived in those hills. Now when Tuor was sixteen years old, the elves were minded to leave the caves of Androth where they dwelt, and to make their way secretly to the havens of Sirion in the distant south. But they were assailed by orcs and easterlings before they made good their escape, and Tuor was taken captive and enslaved by Lorgan, chief of the easterlings of Hithlam. For three years he endured that thraldom, but at the end of that time he escaped, and returning to the caves of Androth, he dwelt there alone, and did such great hurt to the Easterlings that Lorgan set a price upon his head. But when Tuor had lived thus in solitude as an outlaw for four years, Ulmo set it in his heart to depart from the land of his fathers, for he had chosen Tuor as the instrument of his designs. And leaving once more the caves of Androth, he went westwards across Dor Lomin, and found Anon in Gelith, the gate of the Noldor, which the people of Turgon built when they dwelt in Nevrast long years before. Thence a dark tunnel led beneath the mountains, and issued into Kirith Niniach, the rainbow cleft, through which a turbulent water ran towards the western sea. Thus it was that Tuor's flight from Hithlam was marked by neither man nor orc, and no knowledge of it came to the ears of Morgoth. And Tuor came into Nevrast, and looking upon Belegea the great sea, he was enamoured of it, and the sound of it and the longing for it were ever in his heart and ear, and an unquiet was on him that took him at last into the depths of the realms of Ulmo. Then he dwelt in Nevrast alone, and the summer of that year passed, and the doom of Nargothrond drew near. But when the autumn came, he saw seven great swans flying south, and he knew them for a sign that he had tarried over long, and he followed their flight along the shores of the sea. Thus he came at length to the deserted halls of Vinyamar beneath Mount Taras, and he entered in, and found there the shield and hauberk and the sword and helm that Turgon had left there by the command of Ulmo long before. And he arrayed himself in those arms, and went down to the shore. But there came a great storm out of the west, and out of that storm Ulmo, the lord of waters, arose in majesty and spoke to Tuor as he stood beside the sea. And Ulmo bade him depart from that place and seek out the hidden kingdom of Gondolin. And he gave Tuor a great cloak to mantle him in shadow from the eyes of his enemies. But in the morning when the storm was past, Tuor came upon an elf standing beside the walls of Vinyamar. And he was Varanwe, son of Aranwe of Gondolin, who sailed in the last ship that Torgon sent into the west. But when that ship returning at last out of the deep ocean foundered in the great storm within sight of the coasts of Middle-earth, Ulmo took him up, alone of all its mariners, and cast him unto the land near Vinyamar. And learning of the command laid upon Tuor by the Lord of Waters, Varanwe was filled with wonder, and did not refuse him his guidance to the hidden door of Gondolin. Therefore, they set out together from that place, and as the fell winter of that year came down upon them out of the north, they went warily eastward under the eaves of the mountains of shadow. At length they came in their journeying to the pools of Ivrin, and looked with grief on the defilement wrought there by the passage of Glaurung the dragon. But even as they gazed upon it, they saw one going northward in haste, and he was a tall man, clad in black and bearing a black sword. But they knew not who he was, nor anything of what had befallen in the south. Then he passed them by, 
and they said no word. And at the last, by the power that Ulmo set upon them, they came to the hidden door of Gondolin, and passing down the tunnel they reached the inner gate, and were taken by the guard as prisoners. Then they were led up the mighty ravine of Orfalch Echor, barred by seven gates, and brought before Ecthelion of the Fountain, a warden of the great gate at the end of the climbing road. And there Tuor cast aside his cloak, and from the arms that he bore from Vinyamar it was seen that he was in truth one sent by Ulmo. Then Tuor looked down upon the fair vale of Tumladen, set as a green jewel amid the encircling hills. And he saw far off upon the rocky height of Aman Gwareth, Gondolin the Great, city of seven names, whose fame and glory is mightiest in song of all dwellings of the elves in the hither lands. At the bidding of Ecthelion, trumpets were blown on the towers of the great gate, and they echoed in the hills, and far off but clear, there came a sound of answering trumpets blown upon the white walls of the city, flushed with the rose of dawn upon the plain. Thus it was that the son of Huor rode across Tumladen, and came to the gate of Gondolin. And passing up the wide stairways of the city, he was brought at last to the tower of the king, and looked upon the images of the trees of Valinor. Then Tuor stood before Turgon, son of Fingolfin, high king of the Noldor, and upon the king's right hand there stood Maeglin, his sister's son, but upon his left hand sat Idril Celebrindel, his daughter, and all that heard the voice of Tuor marvelled, doubting that this were in truth a man of mortal race, for his words were the words of the Lord of Waters that came to him in that hour. And he gave warning to Turgon that the curse of Mandos now hastened to its fulfilment when all the works of the Noldor should perish. And he bade him depart and abandon the fair and mighty city that he had built and go down Sirion to the sea. Then Turgon pondered long the counsel of Ulmo, and there came into his mind the words that were spoken to him in Vinyamar. Love not too well the work of thy hands and the devices of thy heart, and remember that the true hope of the Noldor lieth in the west and cometh from the sea. But Turgon was become proud, and Gondolin as beautiful as a memory of Elven Tyrion, and he trusted still in its secret and impregnable strength, though even a Valar should gainsay it. And after the Nirnaeth Arnoidiad, the people of that city desired never again to mingle in the woes of elves and men without, nor to return through dread and danger into the west. Shut behind their pathless and enchanted hills, they suffered none to enter, though he fled from Morgoth hate pursued. And tidings of the lands beyond came to them faint and far, and they heeded them little. The spies of Angband sought for them in vain, and their dwelling was as a rumour and a secret that none could find. Maeglin spoke ever against Tuor in the councils of the king, and his words seemed the more weighty in that they went with Turgon's heart. And at the last he rejected the bidding of Ulmo and refused his counsel. But in the warning of the Valar he heard again the words that were spoken before the departing Noldor on the coast of Araman long ago, and the fear of treason was wakened in Turgon's heart. Therefore, in that time, the very entrance to the hidden door in the encircling mountains was caused to be blocked up, and thereafter none went ever forth from Gondolin on any errand of peace or war while that city stood. Tidings were brought by Thorondor, Lord of Eagles, of the fall of Nargothrond, and after the slaying of Thingol and of Dior, his heir, and of the ruin of Doriath. But Turgon shut his ear to word of the woes without, and vowed to march never at the side of any son of Feanor, and his people he forbade ever to pass the leaguer of the hills. And Tuor remained in Gondolin, for its bliss and its beauty and the wisdom of its people held him enthralled. 
and he became mighty in stature and in mind, and learned deeply of the lore of the exiled elves. Then the heart of Idril was turned to him, and his to her, and Maeglin's secret hatred grew ever greater, for he desired above all things to possess her, the only heir of the King of Gondolin. But so high did Tuor stand in the favour of the king, that when he had dwelt there for seven years, Turgon did not refuse him even the hand of his daughter. For though he would not heed the bidding of Ulmo, he perceived that the fate of the Noldor was wound with the one whom Ulmo had sent, and he did not forget the words that Hua spoke to him before the host of Gondolin departed from the battle of unnumbered peers. Then there was made a great and joyful feast, for Tuor had won the hearts of all that people, save only of Maeglin and his secret following, and thus there came to pass the second union of elves and men. In the spring of the year after was born in Gondolin Earendil Half-Elven, the son of Tuor and Idril Celebrindal and that was five hundred years and three since the coming of the Noldor to Middle-earth. Of surpassing beauty was Earendil, for a light was in his face as the light of heaven, and he had the beauty and the wisdom of the Eldar, and the strength and hardihood of the men of old, and the sea spoke ever in his ear and heart, even as with Tuor his father. Then the days of Gondolin were yet full of joy and peace, and none knew that the region wherein the hidden kingdom lay had been at last revealed to Morgoth by the cries of Hurin, when, standing in the wilderness beyond the encircling mountains, and finding no entrance, he called on Turgon in despair. Thereafter the thought of Morgoth was bent unceasing on the mountainous land between Anach and the upper waters of Sirion, whither his servants had never passed, Yet still no spy or creature out of Angband could come there because of the vigilance of the eagles, and Morgoth was thwarted in the fulfilment of his designs. But Idril Celebrindal was wise and far-seeing, and her heart misgave her, and foreboding crept upon her spirit as a cloud. Therefore in that time she let prepare a secret way that should lead down from the city, and passing out beneath the surface of the plain issue far beyond the walls, northward of Aman Gwarif. And she contrived it that the work was known but to few, and no whisper of it came to Maeglin's ears. Now on a time when Earendil was yet young, Maeglin was lost, for he, as has been told, loved mining and quarrying after metals above all other craft and he was master and leader of the elves who worked in the mountains distant from the city, seeking after metals for their smithying of things both of peace and war. But often Maeglin went with few of his folk beyond the leaguer of the hills, and the king knew not that his bidding was defied, and thus it came to pass, as fate willed, that Maeglin was taken prisoner by orcs and brought to Angband. Maeglin was no weakling or craven, but the torment wherewith he was threatened cowed his spirit, and he purchased his life and freedom by revealing to Morgoth the very place of Gondolin and the ways whereby it might be found and assailed. Great indeed was the joy of Morgoth, and to Maeglin he promised the lordship of Gondolin as his vassal, and the possession of Idril Celebrindel when the city should be taken. And indeed, desire for Idril and hatred for Tuor led Maeglin the easier to his treachery, most infamous in all the histories of the elder days. But Morgoth sent him back to Gondolin, lest any should suspect the betrayal, and so that Maeglin should aid the assault from within when the hour came. And he abode in the halls of the king with smiling face and evil in his heart, while the darkness gathered ever deeper upon Idril. At last, in the year when Earendil was seven years old, Morgoth was ready, and he loosed upon Gondolin his balrogs and his orcs and his wolves, and with them came dragons of the brood of Glaurung, 
and they were become now many and terrible. The host of Morgoth came over the northern hills, where the height was greatest, and the watch least vigilant. And it came at night upon a time of festival, when all the people of Gondolin were upon the walls to await the rising sun, and sing their songs at its uplifting. For the morrow was the great feast that they named the Gates of Summer. But the red light mounted the hills in the north, and not in the east, and there was no stay in the advance of the foe until they were beneath the very walls of Gondolin, and the city was beleaguered without hope. Of the deeds of desperate valour there done by the chieftains of the noble houses and their warriors, and not least by Tuor, much is told in The Fall of Gondolin. Of the battle of Ecthelion of the Fountain with Gothmog, lord of Balrogs, in the very square of the king, where each slew the other, and of the defence of the tower of Turgon by the people of his household until the tower was overthrown. And mighty was its fall, and the fall of Turgon in its ruin. Tuor sought to rescue Idril from the sack of the city, but Maeglin had laid hands on her and on Earendil, and Tuor fought with Maeglin on the walls and cast him far out, and his body as it fell smote the rocky slopes of Amon Guareth thrice, ere it pitched into the flames below. Then Tuor and Idril led such remnants of the people of Gondolin as they could gather in the confusion of the burning, down the secret way which Idril had prepared. And of that passage the captains of Angband knew nothing, and thought not that any fugitives would take a path towards the north and the highest parts of the mountains, and the nighest to Angband. The fume of the burning, and the steam of the fair fountains of Gondolin, withering in the flame of the dragons of the north, fell upon the vale of Tumladen in mournful mists. And thus was the escape of Tuor and his company aided, for there was still a long and open road to follow from the tunnel's mouth to the foothills of the mountains. Nonetheless they came thither, and beyond hope they climbed in woe and misery, for the high places were cold and terrible, and they had among them many that were wounded, and women and children. There was a dreadful pass, Kirith Thoronath it was named, the Eagle's Cleft, where beneath the shadow of the highest peaks a narrow path wound its way. On the right hand it was walled by a precipice, and on the left a dreadful fall leapt into emptiness. Along that narrow way their march was strung when they were ambushed by orcs, for Morgoth had set watchers all about the encircling hills, and a balrog was with them. Then dreadful was their plight, and hardly would they have been saved by the valour of yellow-haired Glorfindel, chief of the house of the golden flower of Gondolin, had not Thorondor come timely to their aid. Many are the songs that have been sung of the duel of Glorfindel with the Balrog upon a pinnacle of rock in that high place, and both fell to ruin in the abyss. But the eagles coming stooped upon the orcs and drove them shrieking back, and all were slain or cast into the deeps, so that rumour of the escape from Gondolin came not until long after to Morgoth's ears. Then Thorondor bore up Glorfindel's body out of the abyss, and they buried him in a mound of stones beside the pass. And a green turf came there, and yellow flowers bloomed upon it amid the barrenness of stone, until the world was changed. Thus, led by Tuor, son of Huor, the remnant of Gondolin passed over the mountains, and came down into the Vale of Sirion and fleeing southward by weary and dangerous marches, they came at length to Nan Tathrin, the land of willows, for the power of Ulmo yet ran in the great river, and it was about them. There they rested a while, and were healed of their hurts and weariness, but their sorrow could not be healed. And they made a feast in memory of Gondolin, and of the elves that had perished there, the maidens and the wives and the warriors of the king. And for Glorfindel, the beloved, many were the songs they sang under the willows of Nantathrin in the waning of the year. 
There Tuor made a song for Earendil his son, concerning the coming of Ulmo, the lord of waters, to the shores of Nevrast aforetime. And the sea-longing woke in his heart, and in his son's also. Therefore Idril and Tuor departed from Nan Tathrin, and went southwards down the river to the sea. And they dwelt there by the mouths of Sirion, and joined their people to the company of Elwing, Dior's daughter, that had fled thither but a little while before. And when the tidings came to Balar of the fall of Gondolin and the death of Turgon, Eranian Gil-Galad, son of Fingon, was named High King of the Noldor in Middle-earth. But Morgoth thought that his triumph was fulfilled, recking little of the sons of Feanor and of their oath, which had harmed him never, and turned always to his mightiest aid. And in his black thought he laughed, regretting not the one Silmaril that he had lost. For by it, as he deemed, the last shred of the people of the Eldar should vanish from Middle-earth and trouble it no more. If he knew of the dwelling by the waters of Sirion, he gave no sign, biding his time and waiting upon the working of oath and lie. Yet by Sirion and the sea there grew up an elven folk, the gleamings of Doriath and Gondolin. And from Bala the mariners of Círdan came among them, and they took to the waves and the building of ships, dwelling ever nigh to the coasts of Arvanian under the shadow of Ulmo's hand. And it is said that in that time Ulmo came to Valinor out of the deep waters, and spoke there to the Valar of the need of the elves, and he called on them to forgive them, and rescue them from the overmastering might of Morgoth, and win back the Silmarils, wherein alone now bloomed the light of the days of bliss, when the two trees still shone in Valinor. But Manwe moved not, and of the counsels of his heart, what tale shall tell? The wise have said that the hour was not yet come, and that only one speaking in person for the cause of both elves and men, pleading for pardon on their misdeeds and pity on their woes, might move the counsels of the powers. And the oath of Feanor, perhaps even Manwe could not loose, until it found its end and the sons of Feanor relinquished the Silmarils, upon which they had laid their ruthless claim. For the light which lit the Silmarils, the Valar themselves had made. In those days, Tuor felt old age creep upon him, and ever a longing for the deeps of the sea grew stronger in his heart. Therefore he built a great ship, and he named it Earamme, which is sea-wing. And with Idril Celebrindal he set sail into the sunset and the west, and came no more into any tale or song. But in after days it was sung that Tuor alone of mortal men was numbered among the elder race, and was joined with the Noldor whom he loved, and his fate is sundered from the fate of men. Of the Voyage of Earendil and the War of Wrath. Bright Earendil was then lord of the people that dwelt nigh to Sirion's mouths, and he took to wife Elwing the Fair, and she bore to him Elrond and Elros, who are called the Half Elvin. Yet Earendil could not rest, and his voyages about the shores of the hither lands eased not his unquiet. Two purposes grew in his heart, blended as one in longing for the wide sea. He sought to sail thereon, seeking after Tuor and Idril, who returned not. And he thought to find, perhaps, the last shore, and bring, ere he died, the message of elves and men to the Valar in the west, that should move their hearts to pity for the sorrows of Middle-earth. Now Earendil became fast in friendship with Círdan the shipwright, who dwelt on the Isle of Balar with those of his people who escaped from the sack of the havens of Brithumbar and Eglarest. With the aid of Círdan, Yarendil built Vingilot the foam flower, fairest of the ships of song. Golden were its oars and white its timbers, hewn in the birchwoods of Nimbrethil, 
and its sails were as the argent moon. In the lay of Eärendil is many a thing sung of his adventures in the deep and in lands untrodden, and in many seas and in many isles. But Elwing was not with him, and she sat in sorrow by the mouths of Sirion. Eärendil found not Tuor nor Idril, nor came he ever on that journey to the shores of Valinor, defeated by shadows and enchantment, driven by repelling winds, until in longing for Elwing he turned homeward towards the coast of Beleriand. And his heart bade him haste, for a sudden fear had fallen on him out of dreams, and the winds that before he had striven with might not now bear him back as swift as his desire. Now when first the tidings came to Maithros that Elwing yet lived, and dwelt in possession of the Silmaril by the mouths of Sirion, he, repenting of the deeds in Doriath, withheld his hand. But in time the knowledge of their oath unfulfilled returned to torment him and his brothers. And gathering from their wandering hunting paths, they sent messages to the havens of friendship and yet of stern demand. Then Elwing and the people of Sirion would not yield the jewel which Beren had won and Luthien had worn, and for which Dior the Fair was slain. And least of all, while Eärendil their lord was on the sea, for it seemed to them that in the Silmaril lay the healing and the blessing that had come upon their houses and their ships. And so they came to pass, the last and cruelest of the slayings of elf by elf, and that was the third of the great wrongs achieved by the accursed oath. For the sons of Feanor that yet lived came down suddenly upon the exiles of Gondolin and the remnant of Doriath, and destroyed them. In that battle some of their people stood aside, and some few rebelled and were slain upon the other part, aiding Elwing against their own lords. For such was the sorrow and confusion in the hearts of the Eldar in those days. But Maithros and Maglor won the day, though they alone remained thereafter of the sons of Feanor, for both Amrod and Amras were slain. Too late the ships of Círdan and Gil-galad the High King came hasting to the aid of the elves of Sirion, and Elwing was gone, and her sons. Then such few of that people as did not perish in the assault joined themselves to Gil-galad and went with him to Balar, and they told that Elros and Elrond were taken captive but Elwing, with the Silmaril upon her breast, had cast herself into the sea. Thus Maedros and Maglor gained not the jewel, but it was not lost. For Ulmo bore up Elwing out of the waves, and he gave her the likeness of a great white bird, and upon her breast there shone as a star the Silmaril, as she flew over the water to seek Eärendil her beloved. On a time of night, Eärendil, at the helm of his ship, saw her come towards him as a white cloud exceeding swift beneath the moon, as a star over the sea moving in strange course, a pale flame on wings of storm. And it is sung that she fell from the air upon the timbers of Vingilot in a swoon, nigh unto death for the urgency of her speed, and Eärendil took her to his bosom. But in the morning, with marvelling eyes, he beheld his wife in her own form beside him, with her hair upon his face, and she slept. Great was the sorrow of Eärendil and Elwing for the ruin of the havens of Sirion, and the captivity of their sons, and they feared that they would be slain. But it was not so. For Maglor took pity upon Elros and Elrond, and he cherished them and love grew after between them, as little might be thought. But Maglor's heart was sick and weary with the burden of the dreadful oath. Yet Eärendil saw now no hope left in the lands of Middle-earth, and he turned again in despair, and came not home, but sought back once more to Valinor with Elwing at his side. He stood now most often at the prow of Vingilot, and the Silmaril was bound upon his brow. 
and ever its light grew greater as they drew into the west. And the wise have said that it was by reason of the power of that holy jewel that they came in time to waters that no vessels save those of the Teleri had known. And they came to the enchanted isles, and escaped their enchantment. And they came into the shadowy seas, and passed their shadows. And they looked upon the Tol Eresia, the lonely isle, but tarried not. And at the last they cast anchor in the Bay of Eldamar, and the Teleri saw the coming of that ship out of the east, and they were amazed, gazing from afar upon the light of the Silmaril, and it was very great. Then Eärendil, first of living men, landed on the immortal shores, and he spoke there to Elwing and to those that were with him, and they were three mariners who had sailed all the seas beside him, Falatha, Erelont, and Eärendil were their names. And Eärendil said to them, Here none but myself shall set foot, lest you fall under the wrath of the Valar. But that peril I will take on myself alone, for the sake of the two kindreds. But Elwing answered, Then would our paths be sundered for ever. But all thy perils I will take on myself also. And she leapt into the white foam and ran towards him. But Eärendil was sorrowful, for he feared the anger of the lords of the west upon any of Middle-earth that should dare to pass the leaguer of Ammon. And there they bade farewell to the companions of their voyage, and were taken from them for ever. Then Eärendil said to Elwing, Await me here, for one only may bring the message that it is my fate to bear. And he went up alone into the land, and came into the Kalakiria, and it seemed to him empty and silent. For even as Morgoth and Ungoliant came in ages past, so now Eärendil had come at a time of festival, and well-nigh all the elven folk were gone to Valimar, or were gathered in the halls of Manwe upon Tani Quetil, and few were left to keep watch upon the walls of Tyrion. But some there were who saw him from afar, and the great light that he bore, and they went in haste to Valimar. But Eärendil climbed the green hill of Tuna, and found it bare, and he entered into the streets of Tyrion, and they were empty, and his heart was heavy, for he feared that some evil had come even to the blessed realm. He walked in the deserted ways of Tyrion, and the dust upon his raiment and his shoes was a dust of diamonds, and he shone and glistened as he climbed the long white stairs, and he called aloud in many tongues, both of elves and men, but there were none to answer him. Therefore he turned back at last towards the sea. But even as he took the shoreward road, one stood upon the hill and called to him in a great voice, crying, Hail, Eärendil, of mariners most renowned, the looked-for that cometh at unawares, the longed-for that cometh beyond hope. Hail, Eärendil, bearer of light before the sun and moon, splendor of the children of earth, Star in the darkness, jewel in the sunset, radiant in the morning. That voice was the voice of Eonwe, herald of Manwe. And he came from Valimar, and summoned Eärendil to come before the powers of Arda. And Eärendil went into Valinor, and to the halls of Valimar, and never again set foot upon the lands of men. Then the Valar took counsel together, and they summoned Ulmo from the deeps of the sea. And Eärendil stood before their faces, and delivered the errand of the two kindreds. Pardon, he asked, for the Noldor, and pity for their great sorrows, and mercy upon men and elves, and succour in their need. And his prayer was granted. It is told among the elves that after Eärendil had departed, seeking Elwing his wife, Mandos spoke concerning his fate, and he said, Shall mortal man step living upon the undying lands and yet live? But Ulmo said, For this he was born into the world, and say unto me, Whether is he Eärendil Tuor, son of the line of Hador, or the son of Idril, 
Torgon's daughter of the elven house of Finwe. And Mandos answered, Equally the Noldor who went willfully into exile may not return hither. But when all was spoken, Manwe gave judgment, and he said, In this matter the power of doom is given to me. The peril that he ventured for love of the two kindreds shall not fall upon Eärendil, nor shall it fall upon Elwing his wife, who entered into peril for love of him. But they shall not walk again ever among elves or men in the outer lands, and this is my decree concerning them. To Eärendil and to Elwing and to their sons shall be given leave each to choose freely to which kindred their fates shall be joined, and under which kindred they shall be judged. Now when Eärendil was long time gone, Elwing became lonely and afraid, and wandering by the margin of the sea she came near to Alqualande, where lay the Teleri'n fleets. There the Teleri befriended her, and they listened to her tales of Doriath and Gondolin and the griefs of Beleriand, and they were filled with pity and wonder. And there Eärendil returning found her at the haven of the swans. But ere long they were summoned to Valimar, and there the decree of the elder king was declared to them. Then Eärendil said to Elwing, Choose thou, for now I am weary of the world. And Elwing chose to be judged among the first-born children of Iluvatar, the cause of Luthien, and for her sake Eärendil chose alike, though his heart was rather with the kindred of men and the people of his father. Then at the bidding of the Valar, Eonwe went to the shore of Ammon, where the companions of Eärendil still remained awaiting tidings. And he took a boat, and the three mariners were set therein, and the Valar drove them away into the east with a great wind. But they took Vingilot and hallowed it, and bore it away through Valinor to the uttermost rim of the world, and there it passed through the door of night, and was lifted up even into the oceans of heaven. Now fair and marvellous was that vessel made, and it was filled with a wavering flame, pure and bright. And Eärendil the mariner sat at the helm, glistening with dust of elven gems, and the Silmaril was bound upon his brow. Far he journeyed in that ship, even into the starless voids, but most often was he seen at morning or at evening, glimmering in sunrise or sunset, as he came back to Valinor from voyages beyond the confines of the world. On these journeys Elwing did not go, for she might not endure the cold and the pathless voids, and she loved rather the earth than the sweet winds that blow on sea and hill. Therefore there was built for her a white tower northward upon the borders of the sundering seas, and thither at times all the sea-birds of the earth repaired. And it is said that Elwing learned the tongues of birds, who herself had once worn their shape, and they taught her the craft of flight, and her wings were of white and silver-grey. And at times, when Eärendil returning drew near again to Arda, she would fly to meet him, even as she had flown long ago, when she was rescued from the sea. Then the far-sighted among the elves that dwelt in the lonely isle would see her like a white bird, shining, rose-stained in the sunset, as she soared in joy to greet the coming of Vingilot to Haven. Now when first Vingilot was set to sail in the seas of heaven, it rose unlooked for, glittering and bright, and the people of Middle-earth beheld it from afar and wondered, and they took it for a sign and called it Gil-Estel, the Star of High Hope. And when this new star was seen at evening, Maedhros spoke to Maglor, his brother, and he said, Surely that is a Silmaril that shines now in the west. And Maglor answered, If it be truly the Silmaril which we saw cast into the sea that rises again by the power of the Valar, then let us be glad, for its glory is seen now by many, and is yet secure from all evil. Then the elves looked up and despaired no longer. But Morgoth, 
was filled with doubt. Yet it is said that Morgoth looked not for the assault that came upon him from the west, for so great was his pride become that he deemed that none would ever again come with open war against him. Moreover, he thought that he had for ever estranged the Noldor from the lords of the west, and that content in their blissful realm the Valar would heed no more his kingdom in the world without. For to him that is pitiless, the deeds of pity are ever strange and beyond reckoning. But the host of the Valar prepared for battle, and beneath their white banners marched the Vanyar, the people of Ingwe, and those also of the Noldor who never departed from Valinor, whose leader was Finarfin, the son of Finwe. Few of the Teleri were willing to go forth to war, for they remembered the slaying at the Swan Haven and the rape of their ships. But they hearkened to Elwing, who was the daughter of Dior Eluhil, and come of their own kindred, and they sent mariners enough to sail the ships that bore the host of Valinor east over the sea. Yet they stayed aboard their vessels, and none of them set foot upon the hither lands. Of the march of the host of the Valar to the north of Middle-earth, little is said in any tale, for among them went none of those elves who had dwelt and suffered in the hither lands, and who made the histories of those days that still are known and tidings of these things they only learned long afterwards from their kinsfolk in Ammon. But at the last the might of Valinor came up out of the west, and the challenge of the trumpets of Aonwe filled the sky, and Beleriand was ablaze with the glory of their arms. For the host of the Valar were arrayed in forms young and fair and terrible, and the mountains rang beneath their feet. The meeting of the hosts of the West and of the North is named the Great Battle and the War of Wrath. There was marshalled the whole power of the throne of Morgoth, and it had become great beyond count, so that Anfauglith could not contain it, and all the North was aflame with war. But it availed him not. The Balrogs were destroyed, save some few that fled and hid themselves in caverns inaccessible at the roots of the earth, and the uncounted legions of the orcs perished like straw in a great fire, or were swept like shriveled leaves before a burning wind. Few remained to trouble the world for long years after, and such few as were left of the three houses of the elf friends, fathers of men, fought upon the part of the Valar, and they were avenged in those days for Baragund and Barahir, Galdor and Gundor, Huor and Hurin, and many others of their lords. But a great part of the sons of men, whether of the people of Uldor or others new come out of the east, marched with the enemy, and the elves do not forget it. Then, seeing that his hosts were overthrown and his power dispersed, Morgoth quailed, and he dared not come forth himself. But he loosed upon his foes the last desperate assault that he had prepared, and out of the pits of Angband there issued the winged dragons that had not before been seen. And so sudden and ruinous was the onset of that dreadful fleet that the hosts of the Valar were driven back for the coming of the dragons was with great thunder and lightning and a tempest of fire. But Earendil came, shining with white flame, and about Vingilot were gathered all the great birds of heaven, and Thorondor was their captain, and there was battle in the air all the day and through a dark night of doubt. Before the rising of the sun, Earendil slew Ancalagan the Black, the mightiest of the dragon host, and cast him from the sky. And he fell upon the towers of Thangorodrim, and they were broken in his ruin. Then the sun rose, and the host of the Valar prevailed, and well nigh all the dragons were destroyed, and all the pits of Morgoth were broken and unroofed, and the might of the Valar descended into the deeps of the earth. There Morgoth stood at last at bay, and yet... Unvaliant.
He fled into the deepest of his mines and sued for peace and pardon. But his feet were hewn from under him, and he was hurled upon his face. Then he was bound with the chain and Gynor, which he had worn aforetime, and his iron crown they beat into a collar for his neck, and his head was bowed upon his knees, and the two Silmarils which remained to Morgoth were taken from his crown, and they shone unsullied beneath the sky, and Aonwe took them and guarded them. Thus an end was made of the power of Angband in the north, and the evil realm was brought to naught. And out of the deep prisons a multitude of slaves came forth beyond all hope into the light of day, and they looked upon a world that was changed. For so great was the fury of those adversaries that the northern regions of the western world were rent asunder, and the sea roared in through many chasms, and there was confusion and great noise. And rivers perished or found new paths, and the valleys were upheaved, and the hills trod down, and Sirion was no more. Then Aonwe, as herald of the elder king, summoned the elves of Beleriand to depart from Middle-earth. But Maedhros and Maglor would not hearken, and they prepared, though now with weariness and loathing, to attempt in despair the fulfilment of their oath for they would have given battle for the Silmarils where they withheld, even against the victorious host of Valinor, even though they stood alone against all the world. And they sent a message, therefore, to Aonwe, bidding him yield up now those jewels which of old Feanor their father made, and Morgoth stole from him. But Aonwe answered that the right to the work of their father, which the sons of Feanor formerly possessed, had now perished because of their many and merciless deeds being blinded by their oath, and most of all, because of their slaying of Dior and the assault upon the havens. The light of the Silmarils should go now into the west, whence it came in the beginning, and to Valinor must Maedhros and Maglor return, and there abide the judgment of the Valar, by whose decree alone would Aonwe yield the jewels from his charge. Then Maglor desired indeed to submit, for his heart was sorrowful, and he said, The oath says not that we may not bide our time, and it may be that in Valinor all shall be forgiven and forgot, and we shall come into our own in peace. But Maedhras answered that if they returned to Ammon, but the favour of the Valar were withheld from them, then their oath would still remain, but its fulfilment be beyond all hope. And he said, who can tell to what dreadful doom we shall come if we disobey the powers in their own land, or purpose ever to bring war again into their holy realm? Yet Maglor still held back, saying, If Manwe and Varda themselves deny the fulfilment of an oath to which we name them in witness, is it not made void? And Maedhras answered, but how shall our voices reach to Ilovatar beyond the circles of the world? And by Ilovatar we swore in our madness, and called the everlasting darkness upon us if we kept not our word. Who shall release us? If none can release us, said Maglor, then indeed the everlasting darkness shall be our lot, whether we keep our oath or break it. But less evil shall we do in the breaking. Yet he yielded at last to the will of Maedhros, and they took counsel together how they should lay hands on the Silmarils. And they disguised themselves and came in the night to the camp of Aonwe, and crept into the place where the Silmarils were guarded. And they slew the guards and laid hands on the jewels. Then all the camp was raised against them, and they prepared to die, defending themselves until the last. But Aonwe would not permit the slaying of the sons of Feanor, and departing unfought, they fled far away. Each of them took to himself a Silmaril, for they said, Since one is lost to us, and but two remain, and we two alone of our brothers, so is it plain that fate would have us share the heirlooms of our father. But the jewel burned the hand of Maedhros in pain unbearable and he perceived that it was as Aonwe had said, 
and that his right thereto had become void, and that the oath was vain. And being in anguish and despair, he cast himself into a gaping chasm filled with fire, and so ended. And the silmaril that he bore was taken into the bosom of the earth. And it is told of Maglor that he could not endure the pain with which the silmaril tormented him, and he cast it at last into the sea, and thereafter he wandered ever upon the shores, singing in pain and regret beside the waves. For Maglor was mighty among the singers of old, named only after Daron of Doriath. But he came never back among the people of the elves. And thus it came to pass that the Silmarils found their long homes, one in the airs of heaven, and one in the fires of the heart of the world, and one in the deep waters. In those days there was a great building of ships upon the shores of the western sea, and thence in many a fleet the Eldar set sail into the west, and came never back to the lands of weeping and of war. And the Vanyar returned beneath their white banners, and were borne in triumph to Valinor. But their joy in victory was diminished, for they returned without the Silmarils from Morgoth's crown, and they knew that those jewels could not be found or brought together again, unless the world be broken and remade. And when they came into the west, the elves of Beleriand dwelt upon Tol Aresia, the lonely isle, that looks both west and east, whence they might come even to Valinor. They were admitted again to the love of Manwe, and the pardon of the Valar, and the Teleri forgave their ancient grief, and the curse was laid to rest. Yet not all the Eldalia were willing to forsake the hither lands where they had long suffered and long dwelt, and some lingered many an age in Middle-earth. Among those were Círdan the shipwright, and Celeborn of Doriath, with Galadriel his wife, who alone remained of those who led the Noldor to exile in Beleriand. In Middle-earth dwelt also Gilgalad the High King, and with him was Elrond half-elven, who chose, as was granted to him, to be numbered among the Eldar. But Elros, his brother, chose to abide with men, and from these brethren alone has come among men the blood of the firstborn, and the strain of the spirits divine that were before Arda, for they were the sons of Elwing, Dior's daughter, Luthien's son, child of Thingol and Melian. And Earendil, their father, was the son of Idril Celebrindal, Torgon's daughter of Gondolin. But Morgoth himself, the Valar, thrust through the door of night beyond the walls of the world into the timeless void, and a guard is set forever on those walls, and Earendil keeps watch upon the ramparts of the sky. Yet the lies that Melkor, the mighty and the cursed, Morgoth Bauglir, the power of terror and of hate, sowed in the hearts of elves and men, are a seed that does not die and cannot be destroyed. And ever and anon it sprouts anew, and will bear dark fruit even unto the latest days. Here ends the Silmarillion. If it has passed from the high and the beautiful to darkness and ruin, it was of old the fate of Arda Mard, and if any change shall come and the marring be amended, Manwe and Varda may know, but they have not revealed it, and it is not declared in the dunes of Mandos. Akalabeth, the downfall of Númenor. It is said by the Eldar that men came into the world in the time of the shadow of Morgoth, and they fell swiftly under his dominion, for he sent his emissaries among them, 
and they listened to his evil and cunning words, and they worshipped the darkness, and yet feared it. But there were some that turned from evil, and left the lands of their kindred, and wandered ever westward. For they had heard a rumour that in the west there was a light which the shadow could not dim. The servants of Morgoth pursued them with hatred, and their ways were long and hard. Yet they came at last to the lands that look upon the sea, and they entered Beleriand in the days of the War of the Jewels. The Adain, these were named in the Sindarin tongue, and they became friends and allies of the Eldar, and did deeds of great valour in the war against Morgoth. Of them was sprung, upon the side of his fathers, bright Eärendil, and in the lay of Eärendil it is told how at the last, when the victory of Morgoth was almost complete, he built his ship Vingilot, that men called Rothinzil, and voyaged upon the unsailed seas, seeking ever for Valinor. For he desired to speak before the powers on behalf of the two kindreds, that the Valar might have pity on them, and send them help in their uttermost need. Therefore, by elves and men, he is called Eärendil the Blessed, for he achieved his quest after long labours and many perils, and from Valinor there came the host of the lords of the west, but Eärendil came never back to the lands that he had loved. In the great battle, when at last Morgoth was overthrown and Thangorodrim was broken, the Edain alone of the kindreds of men fought for the Valar, whereas many others fought for Morgoth. And after the victory of the lords of the west, those of the evil men, who were not destroyed, fled back into the east, where many of their race were still wandering in the unharvested lands, wild and lawless, refusing alike the summons of the Valar and of Morgoth. And the evil men came among them, and cast over them a shadow of fear, and they took them for kings. Then the Valar forsook for a time the men of Middle-earth, who had refused their summons and had taken the friends of Morgoth to be their masters, and men dwelt in darkness and were troubled by many evil things that Morgoth had devised in the days of his dominion. Demons and dragons and misshapen beasts and the unclean orcs that are mockeries of the children of Iluvatar, and the lot of men was unhappy. But Manwe put forth Morgoth and shut him beyond the world in the void that is without, and he cannot himself return again into the world, present and visible, while the lords of the West are still enthroned. Yet the seeds that he had planted still grew and sprouted, bearing evil fruit, if any would tend them. For his will remained, and guided his servants, moving them ever to thwart the will of the Valar, and to destroy those that obeyed them. This the lords of the West knew full well, when therefore Morgoth had been thrust forth, they held counsel concerning the ages that should come after. The Eldar they summoned to return into the west, and those that hearkened to the summons dwelt in the isle of Eresea. And there is in that land a haven that is named Avalone, for it is of all cities the nearest to Valinor, and the tower of Avalone is the first sight that the mariner beholds when at last he draws nigh to the undying lands over the leagues of the sea. To the fathers of men, of the three faithful houses, rich reward also was given. Aonwe came among them and taught them, and they were given wisdom and power and life more enduring than any others of mortal race have possessed. A land was made for the Edain to dwell in, neither part of Middle-earth nor of Valinor, for it was sundered from either by a wide sea, yet it was nearer to Valinor. It was raised by us out of the depths of the great water, and it was established by Aula, and enriched by Yavanna. And the Eldar brought thither flowers and fountains out of Tol Eresea. That land the Valar called Andor, the land of gift. And the star of Eärendil shone bright in the west as a token that all was made ready, 
and as a guide over the sea, and men marveled to see that silver flame in the paths of the sun. Then the Edain set sail upon the deep waters, following the star, and the Valar laid a peace upon the sea for many days, and sent sunlight and a sailing wind, so that the waters glittered before the eyes of the Edain like rippling glass, and the foam flew like snow before the stems of their ships. But so bright was Rothin Zil, that even at morning men could see it glimmering in the west, and in the cloudless night it shone alone, for no other star could stand beside it. And setting their course towards it, the Edain came at last over leagues of sea and saw afar the land that was prepared for them, Andor, the land of gift, shimmering in a golden haze. Then they went up out of the sea, and found a country fair and fruitful, and they were glad. And they called that land Elena, which is Starwoods, but also Anadune, which is Westerness, Numenore, in the high Eldarin tongue. This was the beginning of that people that in the grey elven speech are called the Dunedain, the Numenoreans, kings among men. But they did not thus escape from the doom of death that Iluvata had set upon all mankind, and they were mortal still, though their years were long and they knew no sickness ere the shadow fell upon them. Therefore they grew wise and glorious, and in all things more like to the firstborn than any other of the kindreds of men. And they were tall, taller than the tallest of the sons of Middle-earth, and the light of their eyes was like the bright stars. But their numbers increased only slowly in the land, for though daughters and sons were born to them, fairer than their fathers, yet their children were few. Of old the chief city and haven of Numenor was in the midst of its western coasts, and it was called Andunia, because it faced the sunset. But in the midst of the land was a mountain tall and steep, and it was named the Meneltarma, the Pillar of Heaven and upon it was a high place that was hallowed to Eru Iluvatar, and it was open and unroofed, and no other temple or fane was there in the land of the Numenoreans. At the feet of the mountain were built the tombs of the kings, and hard by upon a hill was Armenelos, fairest of cities, and there stood the tower and the citadel that was raised by Elros, son of Eorendil, whom the Valar appointed to be the first king of the Dunadine. Now Elros and Elrond his brother were descended from the three houses of the Edain, but in part also both from the Eldar and the Maya. For Idril of Gondolin and Luthien, daughter of Melian, were their foremothers. The Valar indeed may not withdraw the gift of death which comes to men from Iluvatar, but in the matter of the half-elven, Iluvata gave to them the judgment, and they judged that to the sons of Earendil should be given choice of their own destiny. And Elrond chose to remain with the firstborn, and to him the life of the firstborn was granted. But to Elros, who chose to be a king of men, still a great span of years was allotted, many times that of the men of Middle-earth, and all his line, the kings and lords of the royal house, had long life even according to the measure of the Numenorians. But Elros lived five hundred years, and ruled the Numenorians four hundred years and ten. Thus the years passed, and while Middle-earth went backward and light and wisdom faded, the Dunedain dwelt under the protection of the Valar, and in the friendship of the Eldar, and they increased in stature both of mind and body. For though this people used still their own speech, their kings and lords knew and spoke also the elven tongue, which they had learned in the days of their alliance, and thus they held converse still with the Eldar, whether of Erasea or of the Westlands of Middle-earth. And the lore-masters among them learned also the high Eldarin tongue of the Blessed Realm, in which much story and song was preserved from the beginning of the world, and they made letters and scrolls and books, and wrote in them 
many things of wisdom and wonder in the high tide of their realm, of which all is now forgot. So it came to pass that, beside their own names, all the lords of the Numenorians had also Eldarin names, and the like with the cities and fair places that they founded in Numenor, and on the shores of the hither lands. For the Dunedain became mighty in crafts, so that if they had had the mine, they could easily have surpassed the evil kings of Middle-earth in the making of war and the forging of weapons. But they were become men of peace. Above all arts they nourished shipbuilding and sea-craft, and they became mariners whose like shall never be again since the world was diminished, and voyaging upon the wide seas was the chief feat and adventure of their hardy men in the gallant days of their youth. But the lords of Valinor forbade them to sail so far westward that the coasts of Numenor could no longer be seen, and for long the Dunedain were content, though they did not fully understand the purpose of this ban. But the design of Manwe was that the Numenorians should not be tempted to seek for the blessed realm, nor desire to overpass the limits set to their bliss, becoming enamoured of the immortality of the Valar and the Eldar, and the lands where all things endure. For in those days Valinor still remained in the world visible, and there Iluvatar permitted the Valar to maintain upon earth an abiding place, a memorial of that which might have been if Morgoth had not cast his shadow on the world. This the Numenorians knew full well, and at times, when all the air was clear and the sun was in the east, they would look out and descry far off in the west a city white shining on a distant shore and a great harbour and a tower. For in those days the Numenorians were far-sighted. Yet even so it was only the keenest eyes among them that could see this vision from the Menel Tarma, maybe, or from some tall ship that lay off their western coast as far as it was lawful for them to go for they did not dare to break the ban of the lords of the West. But the wise among them knew that this distant land was not indeed the blessed realm of Valinor, but was Avalone, the haven of the Eldar upon Eresea, easternmost of the undying lands. And thence at times the firstborn still would come sailing to Numenor in oarless boats as white birds flying from the sunset. And they brought to Numenor many gifts, birds of song and fragrant flowers, and herbs of great virtue. And a seedling they brought of Celeborn, the white tree that grew in the midst of Eresea, and that was in its turn a seedling of Galathilion, the tree of Tunar. 